Without further ado, I will introduce our guest, Kevin McGill from the university. He is uh, an archaeologist, I think you can call. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> and he's going to talk a little bit about what archaeology can teach us about the future. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like you to give Kevin a warm welcome. I think that's good. Yeah. Can people hear me? I sometimes am told to turn off the mic because I can deafen people a little bit, but we're all good with that sound quality right now. All right, so I really want to thank Knut and Sagba Board for inviting me to come speak to you as somebody that grew up in Lethbridge and didn't always feel like my voice was well reflected in our electoral dynamics. I always felt that Sagba was a place that gave me hope uh, about reasoned political discourse, and so it's really my honor uh, to come speak to you today. Uh, the topic I want to talk about is, as written on the title, Archaeology is the Canary in the Coal Mine. And the question I'm asking is, is whether the treatment of cultural heritage can act as a barometer for different kinds of social issues. Now obviously since I'm asking you as a question, I'm kind of presupposing the answer to that is yes, otherwise I'd be wasting your time for 25 minutes. But I want to go through and explore some different case studies of how the treatment of cultural heritage has actually predicted other kinds of social and political events in a, in a wide variety of different ways, and why I think that it's really, really important for us to be paying attention to how cultural heritage is treated. Now my own specialization is I have training in Middle Eastern and Eastern Mediterranean archaeology, especially the languages of the region. At the bottom of the screen you can see pictures of our students from the summer excavating in Jordan. At a, they're, they're right at the base of a Nabataean temple. The Nabataeans were the people that built Petra, right? So this is at a site called Daban. And up above is my other hat, uh, working in southern Alberta. That I'm one of the co-directors of the University of Lethbridge's excavations at Head Smash and Buffalo Jump, UNESCO World Heritage Site. And I want to just highlight Head Smashed in, in the Interpretive Center there and the work our Alberta government did in the 1980s to set up that uh, interpretive center as being a real canary in the coal mine of how well our cultural heritage is treated in Alberta. And, and I think it's a real model for how archaeology uh, can, be, uh, can be powerful, effective, and meaningful to different community members. But I'm going to shift gears away from my actual excavation research and talk more about how archaeology is made sense of by non-specialists in different kinds of public domains. And what I want to talk about is how archaeology in the past sometimes functions as kind of a fault line for us to debate, argue about, fight about different kinds of political issues. And I think that's something that lies at the heart of what SACPA does, which is founded to debate and argue and, and sort of navigate these different fault lines. Lines in, in our community, right? So archaeology does this broadly. So I use this image uh, to, to show one that meant much to me when I was when I was a kid. Uh, this was from Expo 86 in Vancouver, and the Great Hall of Ramses the Second presented there. And it's quite fun for me to be showing the slide with my grade four teacher, Mrs. May, who's in the audience here, right? So that, that's that's that, that was really qu quite fun for me. But I remember being a kid being transfixed by this Ramses the Second exhibit at the World. Expo. But it's one of these things that's led me to think for a long time, well, why do we have ancient exhibitions at the Expos, which are about the future, about progress, about technology? And as I've studied this more and more, we come to see how the ancient world functions as a kind of juxtaposi juxtaposition, a kind of place to compare and contrast where we've been, where we're going, and how it's used to make different arguments about how new futures should come about. So. I want to step back in time, though, to 1798, to Napoleon's expedition to Egypt, where I really see a major transformation in how archaeology becomes communicated to the larger public. So some of you might have seen the Napoleon film right now. I was disappointed. Only two minutes in Egypt and not very much well done. But in any case, uh, this is an image from after Napoleon's exhibition, uh, expedition there in 1798, uh, with him gazing at the Sphinx. And the idea here is that Napoleon is the new sphinx.
Jinx, the new pharaoh, right? The idea is that France is taking over from where Egypt once was. And it reflects this 19th century romantic notion that there is only ever one dominant society in the world in a given time, and that it just gets passed, the mantle gets passed between different groups in different places. And so France here is laying claim to be that dominant world power with this kind of imagery. But now when Napoleon went to Egypt, he brought with him a whole team of scholars, what are in French called savants. And these were like gentlemen scholars, people who did science, the fine arts, they were experts in scientific illustration. And Napoleon is very explicit in how he wants to conquer Egypt. He doesn't want to just conquer Egypt militarily. He wants to conquer it socially and intellectually. And he describes this, and he brings this team with him to go and travel throughout Egypt and map as much as they possibly can to draw as many things as they can. And the drawings and the materials they produce are absolutely remarkable, right? So here is a one plate from this massive, massive volume that gets created from the expedition of different pots that were found in Egypt. You can see the architectural illustrations on the side as well. These are so well done that as scholars we still use the, the materials they created to this day. And it sort of set up one of the foundational things in archaeology, which is we preserve the past by drawing and illustrating it, by taking visual records of these materials. So this became a really, really important element of archaeology. But it also ties into how archaeology came to be used in the colonial extractive economies of the 19th century, right? And so we have Napoleon being the first one to do this. But after Napoleon goes to Egypt, right, then the, the, as the colonial powers in Europe start taking over parts of Africa, parts of Asia, they start to recognize that they can extract items and extract things. And so mining is the most obvious example of this, but people and labor are also examples of this. But archaeology is kind of one of the, f the first kinds of things where these artifacts come back. And the artifacts get treated kind of as intellectual spoils of war. So here's the Rosetta Stone, which was discovered during Napoleon's expedition. It ends up in the British Museum because it is uh, the, the French lose to the British. It gets divided up, the spoils of war get divided up, and the Rosetta Stone comes back to display in the British Museum and becomes one of these trophies that are shown and displayed. And, and, and part of the way the British Museum and the Louvre start to emerge are as global museums to highlight the different hierarchical relationships between different cultures around the world, right? And the idea is that the pinnacle of civilization is at the British Museum or at the Louvre where these things are celebrated and presented in this fashion. And it all kind of pre, you know, it's, it's sort of the beginning of this larger colonial logic that we see embedded within archaeology. The British Museum itself comes to be a fault zone for a number of different debates in the early 19th century. There are arguments about whether people should be, whether the everyday people should be allowed into the museum. And there are debates in Parliament about whether this should happen. Uh, one side of the debate believes that the working class should go there so they're not drinking all the time. It gives some a kind of moral distraction, intellectual kind of edification. Uh, but the librarian of the British Museum famously goes to Parliament and raises concerns that sailors are going to bring prostitutes to the British Museum, and they shouldn't be bringing the prostitutes around the Greek art. And so there is these debates about class that go on that are really fundamental to, Brit to Victorian society, and they play out in this safer space of discussion about access to museum and who should be having access to it, who shouldn't be having access to it, and what the point of museum is, and what the point of public education should be. A really, really important element. Now, within archaeology in the 19th century, it was recognized that bodies, human remains, taken from archaeological sites were things of great interest, of great, you know, power to, con to uh, power and interest to excite the public. And so this is the mummy, muse the mummy room in the British Museum. It still looks much like this today, but this is a Victorian illustration of when it first opened. And the reviews from 19th century were kind of mixed. Like it seemed really, really interesting and, and charismatic to see these mummies, but they also complain about the horrific smell of the mummies and the weird temperature that the room has to be in uh, to, to house the mummies. But this actual like claiming of physical bodies by museums just was accepted practice in the 19th century. 
And where we get more problematic issues in relation to that is when we turn to North America, and especially the United States, and the treatment of human remains in archaeological sites in North America, and how that relates to a different kind of colonial practice, and the different the, the differential treatment of First Nations groups by museums. So this is an image from the Smithsonian, uh, early 20th century image, right? And so the Smithsonian was, you know, a really really important institution institution in establishing North American archaeology, but it also played this role in the colonial project of the United States, where as there's westward expansion in the United States, as First Nations lands are taken away, there's a recognition that First Nations culture is being destroyed. And so the museum comes to be this place to preserve First Nations culture. Uh, and the idea is you take these artifacts, you document as much as you can about First Nations culture, but it almost allows, facilitates a kind of acceptance of, I don't want to go so far as to say genocide, but close to genocide, but certainly uh, facilitates cultural destruction because it allows this idea that extinction is just what happens with progress, right? We extinguish, we destroy, we kill off, societies die off. Archaeologists can preserve snapshots and preserve the bodies of the people because this now becomes part and parcel of what belongs to the state. And so it became apparent over the 20, course of the 20th century that museums had different relationships to First Nations bodies as to European settler bodies, and as that racist realization came to be, museums started moving to transform these practices. But the real sort of violence against First Nation sites, I think, culminated in uh, 1987 in Kentucky in what's known as sort of the Slack Farm looting. And what had happened at this site, you can see this picture uh, from, from the Slack Farm. All these pits around the site are where looters had come and looted the site, uh, digging, up, uh, digging up Mississippian era bodies and artifacts and taking them for their own use. They had paid the owner of the farm about $10,000 to just be allowed to go onto the site and just ransack and pillage these sites. And so once this was revealed to the public, the horror and the outrage and the treatment and the desecration of, of human remains was seen to be so appalling that different kinds of legislation were enacted. And now, depending on where you are in the United States or Canada, it's usually in Canada, it's a provincial jurisdiction, but we have different kinds of legislation that's used that we can use to try to protect protect uh, First Nations materials and prevent this kind of desecration. But it really took until 1987 that this kind of violence against First Nations bodies was seen to be really, really problematic by the general public and made for some dramatic changes. So I want to shift away from back from North America, another example of the destruction of cultural heritage that, again, I think worked really, really well to show us that something was wrong. And so this is an image of the Bamiyan, one of the Bamiyan Buddhas in Afghanistan. This is really, really important cultural heritage. This, these were massive, massive carvings. You can see, you might not be able to see it at the back so much, but the small people in the bottom give you a sense of the scale of how gigantic these sculptures once were. And these were sculptures that were carved on the route between South Asia to East Asia, and they document the spread of Buddhism from South Asia to East Asia. So an incredibly important part of global history that's really, really important to a number of different groups around the world, and really to our understanding of how, how globalization works. So we had a sense in the late 1990s with the Taliban emerging that there were some practices that were not, the, the treatment of women were problematic, and the treatment of cultural heritage were problematic. And so I think those should have been early signs for us that something was deeply, deeply wrong in Afghanistan, and those of us that work in the field uh, were quite cognizant of this. In 2000, the Taliban decided to destroy the Bamiyan Buddhas, and so here's an image of them being blown up, much to all archaeologist horror. And, and here is a image of what they look like now, before and after. So you can see on the left what the Buddhas looked like before they were destroyed, and on the right, now that they were obliterated by the Taliban. And this is part of the Taliban's Islamist ideology that didn't believe in these kinds of depictions were ethical or should be there. So they were eradicated, and our own history was, our world global history was destroyed by this. And again, we saw, uh, you know, how, how deeply troubling the Taliban became after that, right? And so. We get to 2001, we get to 9-11, right? And, and then, but, but, you know, again, cultural heritage can give us a heads up about public policy. And so for those of us that watch Colin Powell talk to the United Nations about Iraq's involvement 
in 9-11, we knew that this was a lie. We knew that this was not the case. We knew that there was no possible way that Iraq or Saddam Hussein could have been involved in this in any way. The Taliban and the, uh, the Saddam Hussein regime have radically different, had radically different ideologies. They were not friendly with one another. They were arch enemies. They were oppositional forces. And we can again look to Saddam Hussein's treatment of antiquities to get a sense of what his own ideology was and his own practices of state craft were. So on the on your left hand side, you see an image, a sort of propaganda poster of Saddam Hussein, and he's standing there in profile with this image behind him. And on the right is one of the images, the kinds of images that he's referring to there. This is a carving from a Neo-Assyrian palace, right? So this is a, a probably some kind of winged genie, but you can see the face and the beard and the headdress. And so for anybody in Iraq, they would have seen this image and been able to immediately recognize what he's referring to here. And here he's proclaiming him himself as being a Mesopotamian king. He's calling back to an older period of uh, Iraqi history, well before Islam existed, because he was trying to govern a very difficult country to govern, where you have radically different takes on Islam all operating together. And so for him, the ideology was an ideology of secularism, of pre-Islamic Iraq. And he says this very, he was very uh, open about this in, a, in this media interview, a uh, quote here at length. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, and that's the Babylonian king he wants to refer to, and I'll say more about Nebuchadnezzar in a minute. But Nebuchadnezzar stirs in me everything relating to pre-Islamic ancient history. And what is most important to me about Nebuchadnezzar is the link between the Arabs' abilities and the liberation of Palestine. Nebuchadnezzar was, after all, an Arab from Iraq, albeit ancient Iraq. That is why whenever I remember Nebuchadnezzar, I like to remind the Arabs, Iraqis in particular, of their historical responsibilities. It is a burden that should spur them into action because of their history, right? So here he is referring to a secular, right, sensibility of, of tying himself into Nebuchadnezzar, so pre-Islamic history. But Nebuchadnezzar is also the king who destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the first Jewish temple. So he's also invoking a sense of anti-Israel in along with his claims to a secular Iraq. And so when we see arguments like this, it was quite clear that this is nothing that will work well with the ideology of, of the Taliban. And you know, Saddam, this is, these are, there's lots of examples of Saddam Hussein's invocation of antiquities. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side is Saddam Hussein's palace, and on the left-hand side is ancient Babylon. And his attempt to build his palace was to imitate older styles of Mesopotamian architecture. So the one on the left is a, a reconstructed ziggurat, but you sort of the, the angles and the battered slopes are all meant to invoke ancient Mesopotamia. Uh, an ancient Mesopotamian practice was to write your inscription of your, uh, uh, the, your, king, your name as a king and what you did on a brick and build your buildings with these bricks. And he did the same thing, but in Arabic. So this could be exactly the kind of inscriptions that we look at in our archaeological sites. But this is uh, one by Saddam Hussein. It says, built by Saddam Hussein, son of Nebuchadnezzar. So he's not naming his own father. He's saying himself as son of Nebuchadnezzar to glorify Iraq, right? And so this larger argument then about Iraqi society in relation to the ancient world. So when the US Amer British led invasion of Iraq happened, we had further evidence of how cultural heritage can forecast certain kinds of political events. Right? In this case, the sacking of the Baghdad Museum showed to us that there was no actual larger scale plan to govern Iraq after the invasion happened. Right? There hadn't been much thought that had gone into how to actually rebuild Iraq after the invasion happened. And so it was immediately apparent that the US, American, US and British forces thought they would be welcomed with open arms in Baghdad. That wasn't the case the Baghdad Museum got looted and there was no infrastructure in place to protect cultural heritage or to recognize that cultural heritage was going to be an important part of rebuilding Iraq. There just, this just hadn't been thought through. So really, really problematic on that level. Now the Americans worked quickly on this once they realized how bad this was for PR, right, and found ways to get back the antiquities that had been looted from the Baghdad Museum. But it points to this larger problem that we should have seen about the, how, how the public in Iraq was feeling, right? So the animosity 
shown to the museum in Baghdad. And so here is some evidence from the looting and some of the, the, the rooms that were destroyed, artifacts taken away, suggested the kind of anger that existed towards the state and towards the secular state and towards secular models of, 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 of what Iraq could be. And so it pointed to the larger issue that now is being experienced of how to go about reconstructing Iraq, a country that's incredibly factionalized. And we're seeing contemporary events right now are playing out where there are different groups that are jockeying to get control of different factions within Iraq uh, to try to lead it, right? It's a problem that hasn't gone away. And the continued heritage crisis in the Middle East is related to this destabilization where here is a site called Uma, and these are all pits where the antiquities have been looted from the site. And it, this kind of goes on and off right now in the Middle East, depending on who's in control of what area. But the antiquities trade kind of functions the way the, the drug trade works, where you have very, very low paid people on the street selling drugs, or in this case, looting antiquities. And then that money gets increased. Uh, as, as the antiquities move up the line until you have very, very wealthy collectors in Europe and Asia who are paying lots of money to have these antiquities that were looted. And the poor people in Iraq who are doing this looting are making small amounts of money, but in, in the sort of difficulties of their own economic lives, stuck making, having to make choices like this. So again, pointing to this, this the, 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 the problematic issues in the Middle East. So, I, you know, as this kind of destabilization occurred, we get further mistreatment of antiquities. So here I'm showing you again some images from the Neo-Assyrian palaces, and these are giant human-headed winged bulls. Uh, we find them in the British Museum, in the Louvre, and museums across Europe and in North America. Right? These are really massive monuments that were removed by the extractive colonial policies of the 19th century uh, to various places in Europe, but some were left there in Iraq and Syria. And so when ISIS emerged, one of these, another Islamist group, right, uh, uh, anti-secular group, anti-state group emerged, they realized that by attacking and destroying antiquities, they could drum up support for themselves. Uh, they created these spectacles of destruction that encouraged people to join ISIS, that encouraged people to become part of this larger movement, to seeing how much it alienated the West and how much it was a statement against secular society. And so they have these videos on YouTube, and I encourage you not to click on these videos or on YouTube because the more clicks you give, the more the algorithm encourages these things to be per 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 perpetrated on, right? But uh, these images of just glorifying the destruction of the antiquities. All right, so here they are dismantling one. You can see like the hammers being taken to destroy these remarkable pieces of, of Assyrian art. And here you can see the, the oil drums being set up to like to blow the structures up, obliterate them. And then here, uh, Palmyra in Syria. So this is the temple to Bel, which I think was absolutely a unique structure in world history. A really, really unique temple that fused all sorts of traditions from uh, the Greco-Roman world, from the Near Eastern world, maybe even a little bit more from uh, interior Asia. A really, really unique temple that existed in no other location in this fashion. And so this would look like in August of 2015. And in September of that month, when it's destroyed, completely obliterated, right? So uh, devastating destruction. And sort of the, the figure that we often talk about in relation to Palmyra is Khalid al-Assad, who had been working at the site for years. And he was beheaded by ISIS as he was trying to protect the antiquities there and stop them from being destroyed and stopping uh, Syria's cultural heritage uh, from, from being further damaged, right? And so he's sort of one of uh, the archaeology casualties that we can sort of point to by name, but there are so many more casualties in, in these conflicts, right? And again, we see the treatment of antiquities prefigures other, other treatments of people and humans, right, and, and uh, th th that are really quite disturbing. So I'll, I'll lighten the mood up a little bit away from Syria and talk about ancient aliens now for a bit, uh, as I've given you the, the, sad, the horrific stories about the Middle East. But I, I want to talk about another way then that archaeology and the treatment of antiquities sort of prefigure different social movements. So in the late 1960s, early 1970s, you start to get these notions being described that 
aliens came down, visited ancient people, and taught them how to do things or interbred with them and whatever, also different kinds of ideas. And, and the, the, it's, a, it's a basically a racist premise. It's an idea that ancient people were too stupid to be able to do things like build the pyramids, right? And they couldn't do it themselves. There had to have been aliens that came and, and taught them how to do this. There are all sorts of spurious logic is used, right? So I'll show this one again, going back to our Syrian uh, wing genie. Uh, this one is an image that's cited often in the ancient aliens theorists because uh, the, the being has wings, so flying like an alien, and even more suspicious, he's wearing a wristwatch, right? It will be the claim that's made. And you get this kind of spurious logic being used. Another one is like, a, isn't it a coincidence that we pyramids in Egypt and pyramids in Mesoamerica? And you have to answer, not really. Like a pyramid is a pretty simple structure. It's biggest on bottom, smallest on top. It just makes logical engineering sense. But this is the kind of, the kind of logic and argument that gets used to perpetuate these ideas. So why this matters, though, I think more than just as a novelty thing to annoy archaeologists, right, is the way that in the 1970s it became apparent that this stuff sells. Like, people really, really like to read about ancient aliens. They really like alternate theorizing. They really like the idea, or at least some people really like the idea, that archaeologists have some larger conspiracy that we're trying to cover up. And trust me, if I found ancient aliens at Head Smashed In, you all would be the first to know, right? I wouldn't be trying to hide that fact, right? But the logic is that there's going to be some kind of conspiracy that's stopping us from spreading knowledge around. And so you have this kind of conspiratorial thinking emerging with the same, at the same time that different media landscape changes, and people realize, oh, ancient alien stuff sells, right? Ancient uh, conspiracy thinking sells, and we start to get a breakdown in agreed upon truths, great breakdown in agreed upon facts, where we can have people that argue that there is no, uh, that there's no connection between the, the pyramids and the ancient Egyptians, right? The pyramids had to be built by aliens, and this is sort of an acceptable thing that we've allowed to continue in our society with this changing media landscape. And so it becomes really, really extreme when we see like some of these figures. So this is the QAnon shaman from the January 6th uprising at the Capitol. This is a guy that has YouTube, or had YouTube channels talking about the ancient world. They're really incoherent. Some kind of, he's dressed as some kind of like First Nations Viking shaman figure that he describes. And he's really, really clearly inspired by ancient world and thinking about the ancient world and making arguments about the present. So much so that he was willing to storm the Capitol building, right, on behalf of these incoherent beliefs. He's part of a, this larger movement called QAnon, which came to our archaeological attention when they attacked the Pergamon Museum in, in, in Berlin. That museum is now closed for about 10 years for renovations, but it's really a wonderful museum. But QAnon seems to have believed that Angela Merkel was engaging in ancient satanic child murdering ceremonies there. And they went to the museum, and you can see the woman is showing all these images where damage was done. They were throwing some kind of chemical concoction that they thought would break down the magic of the satanic rites that were being done by Angela Merkel or whoever else is part of the EU conspiracy. So it's this kind of really dangerous thinking that actually is enacting by people's imagination of the ancient world. And so the, the, the right's been invoking these symbols for a long time. I think the left doesn't do it so much because the left is often more about breaking with tradition and the right's more about claiming different kinds of traditions, right? But we had it with Mussolini. So Mussolini forecast the invasion of Abyssinia by beginning to uh, setting up an excavation to excavate the Roman road that leads down traditionally to North Africa, and that was part of his statement of building, rebuilding an Italian empire that was great like in Roman times. He adopted Roman imagery. The, the eagle on his hat is an ancient Roman image, and the name fascist comes from uh, the fasces, the, the, a symbol of Roman imperial leadership. There's a statue on the, on the left-hand side of Augustus, right, the, uh, the, the first emperor of Rome. And beside it is a similar statue, but if you look closely, the face is different. The face is Mussolini's face. And the inscription, which you can't read, says Il Duce. And he was celebrating himself as the next Augustus, the founder of a new empire in Rome, right? And so again, invoking antiquities to try to marshal together a new sort of Italy in the, in the sort of leading up to World War II. And famously, we're all sort of aware of the way the swastika is this sort of meaningless ancient symbol, right? We see this in parts of Mesopotamia, you see it in South Asia. It doesn't really have any meaning. It's just a kind of a, a symbol to fill up space. But because it has this ancient pedigree, it was something that was easy for the Nazis to adopt and use and fill it with their own ideology, an ideology that's based on really bad history and really bad readings of the past, and make these arguments that become powerfully, powerfully communicated to people by the use of antiquity and by the use of this ancient symbol.
So I'll, I want to end now by talking about uh, Danielle Smith's tattoo. And um, <laughs> I, I, I realize it's a bad transition. I'm in no way saying that our premier is a Nazi, right? It's just uh, I want to talk about how, how right-wing groups take images like this and use ancient symbols divorced of any real ancient meaning and how they have these kinds of ambiguous senses. So I first came, became aware of this in the lead up to the election last year and I read an article about her steps on having a tattoo shop and how she got a tattoo and sort of like not really paying attention as I'm just reading sort of doom scrolling about the election, right? And then I, I, I read the thing that she's got the Sumerian symbol for, for liberty and I'm like, what? Like Sumerian is one of the languages I work in. It's the first language that's written down in Mesopotamia. Right, so it's uh, uh, really important to, to my field. So I email, start texting our, my friends, like, what's the Sumerian word for liberty? Like, there's no word for liberty in ancient Sumer, right? They, it's, a, it's a modern concept, it doesn't make any sense. So finally get a better picture, because AP picks up on this, and we can see it, and we're like, ah, oh, okay, it's the Amagi sign. And the Amagi sign means manumitted slave. Right, so it's a, it's a symbol that you would use, just in the writing system, to say that a slave's debt's been paid off and the slave is now free. So for whatever reason, Danielle Smith has a tattoo where it's claiming in Sumerian that she's a manumitted slave. Right, so really kind of curious, right, really curious. So then people are thinking, well, why, what does this mean? And somebody pointed out, somebody found, a journalist found that uh, some right-wing think tank of the Liberty Fund uses the same kind of image, right, and probably because their name is Liberty, right, and they're trying to use a, so a draw a connection between ancient liberty and modern liberty, we don't know. People are trying to figure out what Danielle Smith's tattoo means. My guess is it doesn't mean anything to her other than just that her stepson had these sets of tattoos, and this is one that has this kind of larger call-out to the sort of generic right-wing population ideas of freedom, uh, but it, we've also seen as archaeologists how Norse symbols uh, over the 1980s and 1990s were invoked by white nationalist groups in curious ways. We've seen like the QAnon shaman and, and QAnon groups use of ancient symbols in weird ways, and we're probably seeing symbols like this then that even though they probably don't mean anything for Danielle Smith in this context, have this larger meaning to these larger groups and are being communicated in this way, and so I think here is my sort of sense of like we should be watching out for this and thinking about this as we're seeing these very polarizing populist groups coming to the forefront in, in politics around North America, Europe, and elsewhere, right? We need to be paying attention to these symbols. So I'll end now with just by saying that I do think archaeology is a canary in the coal mine and that we should be paying attention uh, to how people are using the ancient world, how they're treating antiquities, and how they're making sense of contemporary times through reference to the past. I think these are all really, really important uh, ways that we need to be thinking about archaeology. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Knut, and I'm happy to entertain any conversation. With that, I will just uh, turn it over to a question period, and uh, we already have a young lady in the queue. So uh, here we go. Thank you very much, Kevin. My name is Maureen Hawkins. Um, part of where I'm coming from, I did my PhD on historical drama. <laughs> and found that usually the past is used either to say, this is what we should do, or this is what we should not do. <laughs> um, and found that yeah, all kinds of cultures keep doing that with the past. Now, you're talking about the present day, and one of the big things that seems to be going on right now with Israel and Gaza is the identity of the Palestinians. Are they late coming Arabs? Or are they an indigenous people? And I read that there was an excavation of a Canaanite burial in 2017 where they were able to extract DNA and found that Jews worldwide have more than half can Canaanite DNA. So do Palestinians. And that uh, Lebanese have over 93%. And the argument seems to be kind of coming down to, for the Jews, we left the land but kept the culture. And for the Palestinians, 
we left the culture, but we kept the land. Um, how do you see archaeology playing into this issue of identity and rights in the Middle East? Yeah, so I think uh, archaeology plays a significant role in, in how identity is treated in the Middle East. I don't want to talk about the genetic evidence you're talking about. I don't think, I don't think the evidence is as clear-cut as described there or necessarily in the articles always, right? So I, I, I feel like genetic evidence is one of these things that we're in the early days of figuring out how to use this archaeologically, uh, and it's charismatic evidence because it seems like it's factual, but I think it's actually much more problematic to sort out what this genetic evidence can tell us. Uh, I, if, if you are reading archaeological arguments about this kind of thing, I would, I would highlight isotopic evidence as being much better uh, because what isotopic evidence does is we're able to see what, what, what plant life people were consuming at a given time and so we know where they physically were located. And that's a different question than trying to say who they were because what we're trying to do when we're saying who they are with this kind of genetic evidence is we're trying to gloss contemporary notions of race and ethnicity and nation states onto an ancient world and so we're a few levels of distance away from making those arguments. But people are trying to make those arguments, right? I think genetic evidence will be something that gets used. Um, you know, the, the issue of the Middle East is problematic. I don't want to speak too much about the situation in Gaza in this forum uh, because I work in the Middle East and I feel like one of the things that's been happening is people have been quick to make statements about what's going on in Gaza and it causes all sorts of harms uh, because the, the remarks aren't always all fell well thought through, right? So I'm happy to talk after we're not filming, I, but I don't want to accidentally uh, say something that's going to cause more harm than help because I feel like a lot of people are hurting right now as we're seeing, right? I think this is an incredibly complex situation and I think the realities of the situation is that we have a number of different stakeholders a number of different conflicts that are manifesting in such different ways. And so I think archaeology comes to be one of these things that does get invoked as arguments in these issues, right? I think I always like to tell my students when you have somebody making an argument about archaeology, about the present, like, well, you know, why does what happened 4,000 years ago impact you today? Why should we stuck with, with those kinds of, you know, why, should, why are we trapped by the momentum of the past, right? So I always think that's a kind of argument that I, I try to teach my students to deconstruct those kinds of arguments. Uh, to your larger, your first set of questions talking about historical drama, I mean, I think that's exactly how, you know, historical drama provides a safe space to talk about contemporary issues in some ways, right? So if you have a play about Elizabethan politics, but you place it in classical times, right, it's a safer way of having that debate without alienating different kinds of political figures, right? And so I think that's one of the values that historical fiction has, is it gives us a different space to talk about different kinds of issues. And I think other genres work that same way. I think science fiction is another kind of genre that gets used in this way where it creates a safe space because you're talking about uh, real life politics but you're talking about it in an imagined location, so it became a safe place, I think, about like some of the early feminist science fiction, where you could articulate really, really strong, powerful feminist arguments in a space that seemed safer for those discussions to be had because it's a science fiction planet, right? So it, it, the archaeology can, you know, historical drama, I think, provides the same kind of sensibility, right? Yeah, thanks. Maria Fitzpatrick. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for... Uh very interesting presentation, and it got me thinking. Um, so indicators of kind of destruction of those historical things. Um, we see in Canada over the last few years, similar kinds of things starting to happen. Um, and I'm just going to mention two. Uh, one was the desecration of the war memorial by somebody urinating on it and by using the Canadian flag upside down for the Freedom Convoy Group. So is that an indicator for us that we should be really paying attention to the use of our national symbols? Yeah, I think it's a good question. You know, more on the modern stuff than my expertise is in, but I think it's an important one. I think it's tied in, right? I think we see, you know, again, these are fault lines, right? So I think the 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 debate about statues and whose statues should be and what kind of commemorations we should have, these are 
powerful, meaningful moments for societies to argue about, right? And people have really strong senses about this. And so these larger fights manifest with these physical objects, right? They're a really easy place for those fights to actually come in and, and find like a location, uh, a, a meaningful place for attack, right? And so, and people will have different senses of what should be done with heritage, how we should commemorate things. You know, I think if you think back a few years ago to the Military History Museum and the debate between veterans feeling like their their work as soldiers wasn't being commemorated uh, in a positive fashion, and the curator is talking about how well we need to be thinking critically about Canada's participation in different kinds of military events. Right, there are always places where different stakeholders are going to have different arguments about how the past should be commemorated and made sense of. But I think you know when we have these larger groups and we're seeing when we're seeing activities that are being connected in different ways. Right, so like the trucker convoy, and we're seeing wider organization of of, of this kind of these kinds of values, and here I would associate the trucker convoy with the sort of irrationalism of QAnon, right? The anti-vaccine movement, things like this, right? Where this breakdown in science, but they're using a coherent set of symbols to connect with one another. I think that tells us that these groups have more influence than what we think they do, and I think it's something that we need to be watching for and, and thinking about then about about what that actually means and what's going on with our civil debate when the civil debate is manifesting as the trucker rally did versus like a debate like in an in a organization like this, right? I think, I think it's a problem that we need to be really cognizant of. So, yeah. <clears throat> My name is Terry Shellington. And thank you, Kevin, for a really thoughtful presentation. <clears throat> As I uh, parse what uh, the examples you've given and so on, and the, the emergence of the trucker convoy and their use of symbols, I'm hearing uh, right-wing groups often grabbing uh, symbols of the past and reworking them or not reworking them, uh, using them improperly. Uh, but I'm wondering, uh, are there examples of left-wing groups that uh, do the same thing, or is this a, a, um, a weakness or a leaning of right-wing groups? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. It's one I've been thinking about a lot, and I think, you know, I, I do think it's more typical of the right because the kinds of arguments that are made tend to be arguments of traditionalism or arguments of returning to past ways when things were better. Like that, that tends to be a kind of argument that has more heft amongst the right than amongst the left, right? Left arguments tend to be more, I think, about ruptures with the past. But there are still times when you see the, the left or groups that you would kind of maybe tie in as left uh, using this. Uh, I think the best example is Pol Pot's use of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. And so Pol Pot was deeply, deeply inspired by engagement with Angkor Wat. And he thought about Angkor Wat quite deeply. And so his idea of creating a classless society uh, in Cambodia and all of the different issues that, you know, the, 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 the incredible violence enacted against his population there uh, was inspired by his misreading of a 1950s-ish French article about Angkor Wat and the nature of class at Angkor Wat. So you can have situations where the left is inspired by these things as well. In terms of symbols, I can't think of too many like left symbols in that, that function in the same manner as the, 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 the kinds of symbols, but, you know, Peace symbol, I guess. Yeah, 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 I guess. Right? So that's true, right? There's a few like this, right? So, but I, I, I think the, the nature of their argument is more compelling to the right, right? That it's a return to the, some kind of glorious days, and those glorious days are imagined however that group wants to imagine the, the, the new future that they want to have has in, having looked like. Yeah, so thanks. My name is Mark Edel. I'm just wondering, what do you feel about repatriation of artifacts? Right now, we have a row between Britain and Greece, and we've had a totem pole come back to Canada. A lot of these artifacts are well preserved, like in the British Museum, and uh, they're, they're kept very well preserved and safety, safely. So, uh, yeah, what's your feeling about repatriation, especially if maybe we, we, uh, uh, we, they might not be as well preserved wherever they're going back to? 
Yeah, it's a really good question, the issue of repatriation. I would say that I don't have a blanket feeling about repatriation so much as a case-by-case -case kind of sense of what it should be. And so repatriation is one of these things that's more complex than at first you might make it out to be. So our concern, you know, that First Nations bodies get returned to First Nations communities, museums are behind that for the most part. Most museums are going to have a repatriation uh, group working on that. But you can't just call up somebody and say, I have some dead bodies to drop on you, right? It doesn't work that way. And you have to figure out who they should go to, how they should be treated, right? So it's actually a really, really difficult issue that way. But I think everybody would be, most people would be in agreement that if it's possible to repatriate human remains, right, from First Nations groups, then that should be the case. When we get to issues like the Elegant Marbles, uh, the Benin Bronzes, we're in more difficult terrain to sort out, and people have much more wider amounts of viewpoints. I'm, I'm sort of torn about this. I, I go back and forth. I love the British Museum. I love working at the British Museum. Uh, but the Acropolis Museum that's set up now in Greece with all the empty spaces where the Parthenon sculptures could go would be a really, really nice place to see all of them. I think we always want to be careful about how we frame the, the, the safety of the artifacts. Uh, the British Museum, if you go and look at the Elgin Marbles exhibit, you'll see a little caveat note saying that there's an unfortunate cleaning incident in the early 20th century with the marbles. And part of this was the conservator at the time didn't believe that it was proper that ancient Greek sculpture was polychromatic, that it was multicolored. And we kind of think of Greco-Roman sculpture as being this pristine white kind of color. But that's an accident of archaeological preservation because the organic dyes, the organic paints don't survive in the sun. So all of the Parthenon sculptures would have been this multicolored, beautiful colored scheme. And so this conservator scraped off all of the paint off of the Parthenon sculptures and destroyed it, right? So, uh, you know, in, in terms of who preserves what, how, it's really, really tough to say. You know, I think uh, we, do, we don't know how politics shift and how things change. So what might be safe in one situation might not be safe in another. So I, I, so where should the elegant marbles go? I don't know, right? I, 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 I don't have an easy answer to that question, unfortunately, right? But I, I do think it's something to be thinking about case by case. But in general, in general, I think the principle is a sound principle and it's a debate that we should always be having and talking about with with all of the artifacts. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Tad Mitsui. And uh, my question is quite away from whatever you are talking about. It's about imperial mounds in Japan where ancient emperor's remains were supposed to have been buried. There are several of them, I'm sure you know. For years, archaeologists would like to dig it up to find out where do the Japanese race actually came from. I personally believe they came from Korea. We came from Korea and pushed the natives, I knew, to the northern islands, there are only 500 pure blood I knew left. So in order to find out the honest history of Japanese invasion or Korean invasion of Japanese peninsula to push the natives away and exterminate them, we have to find, by digging those mounds, to find out where these emperors 1,000, 2,000 years ago came from. And uh, for a long time, government did not allow any archaeologist to go and dig it up. But recently, I heard the rumor that some of them are now being dug up. Is it correct? <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, I don't know. I can't say if it's correct or not. I, you know, my, my expertise is the Near East and Eastern Mediterranean, right? So East Asia, I only have a, a popular knowledge of, of, of what's going on there. So, uh, you know, I can't say whether anyone's actually excavating these mounds or not. Uh, you know, I think you point to one of the things that is the value of archaeology, right, is the idea that we can have empirical evidence for historical arguments. Uh, and so that's one of the things that I think, that's one of the contributions archaeology can make. It's empirical evidence about long-term change long-term history. Uh, what needs to always be remembered with archaeology 
Benito is that the empirical evidence still requires interpretation. And so you need to always be watching the way that archaeologists will present. Here's what I found. And you want to make sure that you're following the reasoning that they get to to make their larger historical argument, right? And that's where the, the space for problematic arguments can come from, right? So, but, but I think, you know, your, your larger point about archaeology being able to contribute to that debate, I think you're probably right. It could contribute. Uh, but it's outside my area of expertise, right? I'm more Middle East, Eastern Mediterranean. Thanks for your talk. My name is David Major. Um, I want to go back to the modern day again and ask you how, how does this woke stuff, I don't know how to describe it, other than that uh, it, it seems to me that uh, we're, 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 especially our kids, say, Dad, you can't say that. You know, it's, it's as if uh, there's limits on what we can talk about, even though we might have had experience over our lives, lifetimes. And it seems, and, and so what I'm wondering is, how is all this pressure on us to limit discussing our past or experiences, how does that interact with all this c trucker convoy and stuff? Are those people frustrated that they're, or is this woke system suppressing other people? Or like, how do the two interact? That's probably a tough question for me to answer as an archaeologist. Uh, <laughs> But what I, I might point out about the idea of, you know, the, the concern about our kids telling us, like, Dad, you can't talk like that anymore. And uh, I've got a nine-year-old who's already starting to be embarrassed about me uh, taking her to school and things like that. So I'm already getting that sense. Is that there is a long history, we have, like, you know, of, of r r great Roman writings complaining about the same kind of experience of the younger generation not recognizing and putting limits on how we should speak about things. So I think it is something that, that every generation experiences at some level or another, right? So I, I think that, you know, that, you know, I, I imagine a lot of people in this room were arguing against, you know, the, their parents, right, in the 1960s, right, and the values of the 1960s, right? And so this is just something that, that, that just goes with the cycle. And so sometimes you feel like you're connected to those arguments and sometimes you feel like you're disconnected from those arguments. Whether the trucker rally group are feeling uh, frustrated by wokeism, I mean, I, I certainly see that they claim that in the news, right? I can't say that that's within my expertise to have evaluate whether that's one of the things that's actually driving their frustrations or there's other issues that are at play in it, right? It's, but I, I've, I've seen those claims made, but I, I'm not in a position, I'm not an expert in that to be able to, 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 to make an argument one way or the other in that way. We're going to have an interruption in power in about half an hour. Just we'll, we'll be gone. Yeah, we'll be gone. We'll be gone. Yeah. Bev Mundell Atherstone, thank you very much. Very thought provoking. <clears throat> As we discussed earlier, the um, anthropologists tried to decolonialize their own way of looking at anthropology by talking about who they were. I am a whatever your your background is, I'm male, female, bi, whatever. I am I this is who I am. I come from this background. I live in this place. And that is who is looking at this anthropo anthropology uh, through these eyes. So you kind of led into that in your previous answer. So I'm wondering when did archaeology decide to look at things in a different way and uh, get away from the previous colonial background? Thank you. Yeah, so it's a good question about how archaeology is changing conceptions are changing conceptions of, of how you should acknowledge your own work as a researcher. And archaeology is kind of an interesting case that way because the earliest archaeologists actually really front their experience and their own personal experiences as part of their authority to engage in the excavations. And you read late 19th century and early 20th century archaeological reports, a lot of them are more like travel literature. Right, and they're about you know somebody's experiences as a British 
elite person going to these locations and experiencing these locations and excavating at the same time. So they're really fronting that in a way that we would laud today. And it's an interesting role that happens with archaeology. Is so th this authority comes to be seen as almost like repressive in the 1950s and 1960s for that generation of archaeologists who got tired of their teachers saying things like, well, I know the site because I dug it. I have a feel for it. I just know the Minoans. Or I just know this group. I just have a feel for it. And so a generation of archaeologists decided, no, we need to step back from our authority as archaeologists and point only to the evidence. And so we get this long trend in archaeology. It goes for about 40 years where the approach to writing about archaeology becomes very, very dry, right? And it becomes very much lists of objects, lists of measurements, dry statistical data where the archaeologists are trying to hide their own interpretive voice as much as they possibly can. And then that changes again and there's a reaction against that again in the 1980s and 1990s where people start to recognize, no, we can try to hide our experiences behind these kind of social scientific methods, but really we're not, so let's get back at, at, again in front of this and acknowledge where we're working from, where our biases are, and how that might be influencing our data, right? And so then you'll see archaeologists have a pretty wide variety of sensibilities of how much it influences them and how much they feel they need to address their own bias when they're going with the data, right? And so that becomes sort of something that's negotiated in different ways by different archaeologists, right? So in terms of the larger colonial issues, I think people are sort of well aware of the colonial implications of archaeology for a lot longer uh, than it necessarily manifests in popular presentations of archaeology, right? So people would know that archaeology was, as they're doing it, it was part of different kinds of nation building enterprises. And so as you're doing your work, you know the different political groups are going to make meaning out of that work. And so now it's more archaeologists since the 80s and 90s are, are back to just addressing that and being upfront about that usage in their own work, right? And much in the way that much other, many other people in the academy are also uh, being, getting out fr in front of that as well. Uh, this will be our last question <coughs> from the, our young lady on the side. And uh, I'll just tell you next week's uh, topic is uh, drug policies or the failure of such by uh, a young lady named Amber Jensen is coming to speak to us. So I encourage you to come next week. So come on up. My name is Wanda Gibbons, and I want to go back to Egypt, okay? We were, we went on tour in Egypt, and we cruised down the Nile, and then we went to Aswan, and they talked about the High Dam, and I was absolutely horrified to hear about everything they flooded without regard. And there's something like 17 temples that were flooded, and they, through the UNESCO and other, and other heritage money places, they did rebuild, and they took apart and reassembled a couple of them. But Weren't that, how do the archaeologists of the world feel about that? Or is it that they've extracted all the knowledge they can gain from those temples that were flooded, the land that was flooded over and all that's gone now? Like, how do they justify that? Or like, is it, can you talk about that a little bit? Because I went away from that absolutely horrified and had no answers to sort of satisfy me. Yeah. Okay, thanks. No, it's a difficult question that that archaeology has to deal with, right, is how much do you, how much conservation are you concerned with and how much do you allow development, right? So uh, it's legislated fairly clear in a clear-cut fashion for Alberta, right? So with people in the resource industry, we'll hire archaeologists. So we actually, with our students, we have 100% employment, right? Because we can't keep up with the demand for archaeologists in Alberta uh, because they get hired to go survey and analyze where construction and developments should go on and how they should play out. So in Alberta, it's, it's straightforward for the most part, but you do get to places where there's conflicts about whether, you know, this should be preserved in this way or should we let a pipeline go in this way? And these are larger issues where communities get together and have arguments like in, in forums like this to sort that out, right? Um, and so it's tough. And dams are, are 
really bad news for archaeologists, right? And so what tends to happen if you know that a project like that is going to occur is there tends to be like a race to get as much evidence as you possibly can out of the ground uh, before it gets obliterated, right? And in those cases, you don't have much say other than the sheer panic of trying to, to save what you can, lobby how you can, right? So it's, uh, it's one of those sad things. But there, the reality is there's no way we can conserve and preserve all archaeological sites. It's just impossible. Uh, you imagine somebody living in Rome and trying to go about their daily life. You know, imagine how difficult it was to build a subway in Rome where you're literally finding an absolutely amazing archaeological site every few feet, right? So there's a certain level where you don't want societies to be completely hindered by archaeology. Uh, but on the other hand, it's, you know, trying to find that balance can be really tough. And for archaeology, it can be heartbreaking, right? Or as you go on your Egyptian tour and you find out about uh, all the temples that were not saved in the Aswan High Dam project, right? It's, you know, it's, it's sad, but it's just the, the nature of, 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 of archaeology. Before we give Kevin a big hand, I'd like to uh, give, him a, give him a chance to s give us a little um, thought to go home with. And maybe in the context of climate change, could you give us uh, a few thoughts to go home with? I usually defer on climate change to the rest of the Geography and Environment Department, which has much better uh, knowledge about the issues. But I will say that when you are thinking about uh, climate change, what archaeology can, can show us is that humans do influence changes in climate. Uh, quite dramatic, awful changes can happen when people aren't paying attention to climate change. Uh, and so these are concerns that are, that are, that are uh, you know, that, that archaeology can, can prove empirically. Uh, our knowledge of ancient climate is, is quite good. The evidence, and uh, maybe you can get Hester Jaskut to come talk about that at some point, about ice cores. Uh, but the evidence is really, really solid about the changing temperatures and changing climate. So th these things are not issues for debate, right? And so I would say that as an from an archaeological perspective, uh, climate change is something that we need to be taking very, very, very seriously. And I think beyond that, we need to be thinking in relation to diversification of our economic lives, right? So, uh, you know, I think Alberta's uh, stepping back from renewable energy sources is something that we are going to be regretting down the road, right? And I think it's short, I think it's short sighted policy making uh, based on sort of knee jerk reactions or immediate concerns, but we need to be thinking in a lot much larger scale and archaeology would certainly uh, gives us evidence to be able to make arguments and think about things on a, on a larger scale. So thank you.